Hello everyone, my name is Prodesilaos, also known as Prot. In this video I want to talk to you about my repetitive strain injury and keyboard ergonomics. As you can see, I have two keyboards here in front of me and I will tell you more about them as I go further into the video. But first I want to start with the injury and how it relates to the usage of the keyboard and then I will go into the specifics of these keyboards and the considerations that go into them. As you can tell, this is not some kind of a studio setup. Uh, there is not enough space for me in the hut to do this kind of video where I have my phone over there and, I'm and I am presenting something in front of it. So uh, the be second best option is to just do it outdoors and I picked this spot that I cleared recently. It is next to the stream. You can probably hear the water. So here I am and I will just be talking and showing you the stuff. So nothing fancy, the usual stuff I do. Let me start with the injury then and how it relates to the keyboard. I have been feeling pain in my forearm and wrist for several months now. There was an acute phase in autumn 2023 where I had to wrap my wrist with a bandage and keep it stable to ease the pain. Uh, this worked and I am uh, happy that I didn't have to resort to uh, more drastic measures. Ever since I have been following a conservative treatment uh, whereby I limit my typing time. I only use the keyboard to do the essentials, to only do my coaching work basically and uh, the essentials of my email correspondence but not much beyond that. So uh, it is more difficult for me to maintain my Emacs packages for example, more difficult for me to write new code, this sort of thing. So lots of tasks that I used to do are now trickier to accomplish because of the limited typing time. However, this uh, treatment uh, is done with the longer term objective of uh, healing me, of uh, um, not aggravating the pain, of arresting the downfall and of reversing the trend uh, so that I can, after a few months, uh, return back to how I used to be. I feel that it works. I feel that uh, things have been improving. Things are moving in the right direction. However, uh, progress is slow, I need to be patient and I need to be careful and of course remain uh, consistent, stay on track until this does what it has to do. And then of course I will have to be careful afterwards so that I don't suffer a relapse of the injury. The injury uh, has two loci, uh, so one locus is over here at the base of the forearm. We have a muscle here that attaches to the bone at this point and uh, so this mus muscle is the tendon and here is where the main area of my pain is. Uh, a secondary one, the second locus is here at the external side of the wrist, uh, uh, this uh, stretch over here. It is not as intense of a pain as this one but I can feel it as well uh, given uh, certain uh, conditions. Uh, there are many types of injury and uh, many medical terms uh, for them uh, but I don't want to go into the technicalities, it doesn't really matter. You have tennis elbow, you have golfer's elbow, you have uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, you have repetitive strain injury, lots of things going on. What matters is that all these are related to some kind of an awkward hand uh, placement or hand or arm placement combined with a repetition. So something that is awkward and keeps happening over and over and over again. In my case this comes from the keyboard and I will show you what I mean right now. Let me just uh, rearrange the items on the table over here. So, as I said, the pain is uh, concentrated in the arm, so the forearm and the wrist. There is no pain 
in the upper uh, parts of the body, so the chest, the shoulders, there is no pain here. It's all located from this point and uh, down to uh, the fingers. This is the idea. Meaning that I can function properly when it comes to physical work, when it comes to manual labor, I can use a pickaxe, I can use a mattock, I can use a sledgehammer, all the tools that I am uh, employing here around the hut whenever I am doing uh, some kind of task and I can do that for several hours on end. I don't have any problem. Of course, I do feel fatigued after working the land or clearing some uh, overgrown vegetation or building something, but I don't feel pain in these spots. But as soon as I use the keyboard, after a few minutes, I feel numbness. And if I keep going, I will start feeling pain until I have to quit. This is the idea. And so this has to do with the angle at which the hand is placed. But first I want, to, I want you to understand how the forearm relates to the fingers. Uh, if you stretch your hand, actually extend it, you don't have to stretch it fully, just extend it. If you, if you extend your arm and you place your hand on your forearm, move gently your fingers and you will notice motion up here. So you know now that the motion happening here actually uh, extends to this place. So we know this. The second thing to consider is when using a regular keyboard like this one, a regular layout, you are asked to bring your uh, hands closer to your center of uh, gravity. So you have to bring your hands in this kind of position and of course if you are on the home row you are like this. This is the idea. Even if you have good posture on the upper body, meaning that you don't roll your elbows, you don't uh, lean on top of the keyboard, even if you have good posture, here at the wrist and the forearm, you have this acute angle that you are seeing right here. So instead of your hand being like this, it is like this. And you start with that position. And this alone, this uh, tension alone, is stressful for the muscle. So you are stretching the muscle and over time this will start tiring it out and uh, fatigue leads to injury if you don't pay attention to it. So we start with this awkward angle and then on top of that we perform this motion which triggers the small muscles over here and those two together contribute to fatigue and uh, that uh, when, once it is done over an extended period of time leads to injury as is my case. This is exactly my problem. My problem was also due to poor ergonomics in general. The office setup was awkward. The height of the desk has to be uh, such that there is almost a 90 degree angle. Of course here where I am it's not like that. I am just sitting at this stool over here, so please bear with me, this is the hut again. But imagine your desk has to be about at the height of a 90 degree angle or a bit lower, but you don't want to have your desk like down there, that sort of thing. Whereas my desk was like that, so it was very low and I was typing like this, so the angle was quite awkward. It was really bad. So there was that. I was using a chair, a plastic chair, the ones you find uh, at a beach, and this meant that I also had to sit in an awkward way so as to not feel pain after a while. Again, uh, making this kind of um, angle here even worse. And also it was the keyboard itself that I was using. It was toy grade uh, materials. I literally bought it from a toy store. So the press, the, the keys were hard to press and this meant that I had to apply more force uh, with the finger. So you have this awkward angle, the arm is already tense and you are also applying a lot of force. 
So basically a perfect storm. The best uh, outcome you can get is a mild injury and basically here is where I am and for the last few months I have been dealing with uh, pain here and with a loss of um, productivity at the computer. So you understand the mechanics, how this works. Of course now I am keeping it simple, you can read more about it, there are a lot of technicalities to consider, but basically this is the idea. Like, if you are sitting at an awkward angle, if you are not taking care of uh, ergonomics, no matter what you do, no matter how many breaks you take, uh, if you are athletic or not, if you have a good diet, etc., etc., it doesn't matter, you will be harming yourself. And in my case, I do all the other things. So I do stretch, I am physically active, I have a good diet, all that is in order, but those awkward uh, uh, placements of the hand were part of the problem. Then we have other things with this kind of keyboard, which have to do with lateral wrist uh, motions. So when you are in an, a home row position, maybe you are not literally on the home row, but you are somewhere in the middle. Maybe you stretch your uh, middle finger and the ring finger, you, you keep them a bit further up than on the home row. It doesn't really matter. The point is that you are towards the center. So when you are towards the center, there are keys that are hard to press and keys that you have to press frequently, such as backspace. So backspace is up there. Of course, you can raise your hand and do this sort of thing. But if you are trying to uh, keep your hands on the home row or closer to the center, this is a really awkward motion. However you do it, either you will stretch your pinky or you will move your wrist laterally. So, of course, if you do this a couple of times, it doesn't really matter. But if you keep doing this every day for hours on end, and we day in, day out, week in, week out, then, of course, that adds up and it contributes to injury again. So, what you want to do is to avoid this, what I was, do what I was showing you earlier, but also avoid these kind of motions, these lateral wrist motions, because these apply a lot of stress to the wrist and to the small muscles here in the forearm. Now let me tell you about the keyboards. So this keyboard over here is the Keychron K5 Pro. It is a programmable mechanical keyboard. I got this as a gift from Arialdo Martini, uh, Arialdo Martini to whom I am uh, most thankful. Arialdo helped me get started with mechanical keyboards. Before that, I didn't know anything. I was an ignoramus. And uh, Arialdo helped me understand what are key switches, what are key caps, how to reprogram the firmware, the QMK firmware of the device, and basically set me up for success. This is the idea. And for me, this was very important to start improving things because I was on a downward uh, trajectory and things were looking really, really bad. So this keyboard with its programmability helped me stabilize the situation and eventually start moving uh, towards recovery. And I did this by reprogramming it in such a way to not use the keys that are on the periphery of your hand. So the idea is to use the pinkies as less, as less as possible. So the pinky is the small uh, finger. To use these fingers uh, as infrequently as possible and to make more use of the thumbs, which are strong fingers and we can apply more force with them and we can work them a bit more than the pinkies. So what I did is to remap the keys that are right next to the space bar to have a dual function. Where the Alt key normally is, the right Alt key, I made it so if I were to tap it, it would register as Enter. And if I were to hold it, it will count as Control. On the other side, I would have Backspace on Tap and uh, again, it would be Control on Hold. 
and I would have similar arrangements for the other keys. The space key in turn uh, was assigned the dual function of performing space on top but if you were to hold it it would activate a layer and uh, layers in um, uh, programmable keyboards are basically the equivalent of the shift key where if you hold shift and type a number it will insert the character that is uh, um, corresponding to that number but if you don't type shift and you hit the number you just insert the number so layers are the same principle when you are holding down the layer key you are registering the key that belongs to that layer rather than the ordinary JK or whatever you have here. So uh, space and HJKL would be the arrow keys and then I would have home and page up, page down, this sort of thing. So I was doing this kind of thing which helped me bring uh, things closer to the thumbs and away from the pinky fingers. This was an improvement, it helped me, it is better all things considered but it is still not good enough because you still have these awkward angles to deal with even if the rest of your setup is perfect. Like even if you have the perfect desk, height, uh, a comfortable chair, you exercise, you are healthy, even if everything else is perfect this sort of thing is not good. So eventually I was, uh, even though this was improving me, I still couldn't uh, get back my uh, desired uh, productivity and I would have to take breaks. Not as many breaks as I had to take before, but I still had to take breaks and be very, very careful. I think uh, this traditional layout can be improved in one simple way by making the space bar uh, by splitting it in two, by making it two keys, even if both keys register space. And the reason for that is so that you can have, should you wish, you can have two different keys for layers. This would be the idea. So one key could activate one layer, another key could activate another layer, and then you would have more options. Whereas now you have this uh, long uh, key, which is basically uh, taking too much space and is not making good use of your strong fingers and it is by extent pushing the modifiers to the side so if you want to press a modifier such as those in the corner either you will have to uh, do something funny with your um, thumb you will have to do something like this and this also rolls uh, the forearm terrible or you will have to do something again awkward with your pinky or raise your hand and do something like this however you go about it this type of keyword will give you problems sooner or later and you may say uh, what happens if I am using Vim keys do those work is that an improvement maybe it is but I don't think I personally don't think this is the case because you still have to type shift you still have to type tab you still have to uh, at one point or another uh, do some of those shifts or long stretches and then it can be awkward though of course it depends on the size of your fingers the size of the keyboard lots of things go into it but at least in my case vim keys on their own do not fix the problem at all Okay, so I uh, said a few things about uh, this keyboard and let me tell you about this keyboard now which is my main uh, board uh, I got this a few days ago so this is the iris keyboard from uh, keeb.io or kibio however you want to call it it is k double -E -B dot io and this is the iris revision 8 uh, model that they are uh, selling of course, as you can tell, this is a split keyboard. It has two halves and the idea with this is so that you can place the halves further apart from each other for you to have a more natural placement for the uh, wrist and how that aligns with the forearm. What you are trying to do basically is when you are having this sort of thing is I will just do it I, I cannot even okay I won't uh, hold it so what you want to do is imagine I am at an angle like this but what you want to do is for this 
to be straight. So there is no tension here. This is straight, no tension whatsoever, and you have that. The keyboard can also be tented as well as tilted, meaning that you can arrange for it not to sit flat on the desk, so for you not to have your hand like this, but for you to have your hand, for example, like this, or depending on the tenting you will be doing or the tilting, you will have a, a different angle uh, here and here. So I ha still have to experiment with that, but the idea is that you can optimize for this as well so that you control all sides of the arm, of the arm and the wrist and that way you don't have any kind of tension while just sitting there. Uh, another feature of this keyboard relative to standard traditional keyboards is that it has a columnar stagger and this means that column by column these are on a straight line but the columns themselves are not aligned so this is not a rectangle rather the columns are placed in such a way to account for the varying lengths of the fingers so the middle finger is further away than where the pinky is this is the idea so this is called a columnar stagger whereas here we have the row stagger so we have it in this direction but here we have it in the other direction when you are uh, reading about keyboards you may come across the term ortholinear uh, so an ortholinear uh, keyboard is when the um, keys all the keys are placed on a grid so you have straight lines in both uh, axes and the, all the keys are like that this is not ortholinear okay but you may see people use the terms interchangeably so columnar stagger or ortholinear but this is not ortholinear strictly speaking of course if you use that term uh, uh, people will understand what you are meaning hopefully and you will be good either way let me tell you now about the feel of uh, the keyboard apart from just ergonomics uh, both are programmable both are mechanical and basically both do the same kind of things the difference between the two apart from the split and the column versus row stagger is that uh, on uh, this one over here uh, we have a lower profile for the keycaps and uh, you can see it from the side it is uh, sleek it looks modern it looks fancy uh, it works it is good uh, but for me personally this low profile is not optimal because it affects the impression of tactility so when you are pressing the key there is a, a space where the switch travels so the spring will travel in the cylinder and this uh, space is very small uh, because of course the switch has a low profile so it cannot travel a lot and basically in practice this means that you can barely press the key and this registers a key press so it is hard for you to uh, control the pressure you are applying before bottoming out so when you are pressing the key it's easy to basically press more than you need to whereas this one has a taller profile as you can see of course if I put them side by side well yeah okay you get the idea uh, this has a taller profile not just for the keycap not just for the plastic on top but the switch underneath that holds the keycap because the switch is higher and this means that when you are uh, performing a key press you have more room to travel and this is easier at least for me this is easier to control the pressure that I am applying so that I don't have to bottom out and uh, do that sort of thing I can be more relaxed with my key presses whereas, whereas with the short uh, travel uh, it's always bottoming out it's always like that 
And uh, for me, this means in practice that I feel that the lower profile is heavier to the touch, even if this is not actually the case. But this is the impression I get because I cannot control the force that I am applying to actuate the key. Whereas here, it is very easy for me to control the force that I am applying. On this board, the keycaps that come with it uh, from uh, Kibio are um, a cherry profile. Um, whereas what I am using here is the OEM profile. The cherry profile is medium to low height. I, I don't know if you want to call it a low height for uh, this type of switch, but medium to low, I would say. So it is medium to low, meaning that these rows over here, I think this is row two and row three, this is how they are called, I think, but I'm not sure, I'm still a beginner in these things. But these are uh, much lower than these other ones. And the sculpt, so the angle, the slope they have, is quite aggressive. So the keys are not all the same height, they don't all have the same shape. They have different shapes to account for where they are positioned. And basically the idea is to help you uh, type easily. But with the cherry profile, because of the steeper slope, I find them more difficult to work with. Whereas OEM are a bit flatter, and for me this feels better. They are also a bit taller, I think by one millimeter, which you may think is nothing, right? What is one millimeter? But I think it makes a difference. I can feel it. Uh, but the real difference is the angle. For me, it's not too steep. It's not too aggressive. It feels easier for me to work with this. Uh, whereas here, all the keys are the same height, and so you have the other problem where it can be harder to uh, find where you are. It, uh, you have, of course, the homing keys on the home row, so there is this little bump on J and F, and this allows you to know if you are on F and J. Uh, but after that, I find it kind of hard to know exactly where I am. And I make a lot of mistakes on that keyboard. Here, it is easier for me, because of the sculpted keys, it is easier for me to um, find where I am. Without looking at the keyboard, I have a sense of where I am. I think what also helps is the columnar stagger, because fingers don't have to move sideways, with the exception of the index. They just have to move up and down. This is the idea. Whereas on a keyboard like this, you cannot just go up, you have to go sideways, so you are moving in different directions. And actually, if you check about this, the sideways motion is optimized for the right hand, but it's uh, actually quite awkward for the left hand. Uh, and I think this is consistent with my experience as well. Whereas here, uh, you perform a motion that is predictable and so once you get used to this uh, you don't miss keys. This is the idea. If you ever check out uh, split keyboards you will see some fancy designs where there are very few keys and actually this has more keys than those uh, fancy keyboards that you will uh, find. Not too many, I still think it's on the lower end, on the lower count, but it has quite a few of them. But you will see keyboards that don't have a number row and don't have this extra row on the side either. So it is a 3 uh, by 5. This is the idea. And may, then they will have 1, 2, 3, I don't know however many uh, keys at the bottom here. But the main grid will be a 3 by 5. That sort of thing. Uh, and uh, you may wonder, okay, is this actually better or is it better to have a few more keys? Uh, I experimented using uh, the programmability of the keyboard. I made the number row dead keys so they wouldn't do anything. And I also disabled this row here, meaning that I only had to work with the alpha keys over here. And the idea was to use more layers. So instead of typing the number row, I would hold down a layer key, like activate a layer, 
and then have the equivalent of a numpad or something like that and input a number. Same idea for symbols, same idea for everything basically. Uh, I used it, it's uh, working, it's fine, I can be productive with it, so if I ever have a smaller keyboard I won't complain, I can totally work with that, but I think for me this is kind of a diminishing returns to scale uh, game and I would even argue that in my case it is a negative returns to scale meaning the more you reduce keys the less your gains are the fewer your gains and in that case you actually start losing because of the added complexity of the longer key presses you have to perform to do stuff and when you are an Emacs user like me and you use of course all sorts of keyboard combinations you don't want to prolong the key presses so I don't want to be doing um, everyday stuff that take more time I find it easier to just press a number by stretching my finger than to have to hold down a key and then um, uh, access the layer and input the number from there of course layers can be done in different ways so you can have a layer that you press and hold you can have a layer that is a one shot layer meaning that you um, type the layer key uh, release it and the next key will be on the layer so you can do stuff like that but still the added complexity the fact that you have to sort of coordinate your fingers better sort of uh, play the piano kind of thing and I am not a musician so for me that doesn't work for me I am just a guy at a hat and you know working with the land so I need something simpler this is the idea and so I have decided to keep the numbers I think they are uh, better for me um, the switches on mechanical keyboards are of course uh, the whole uh, point so they are mechanical switches and every key has its own switch you can uh, remove the keycap you can remove the switch and you can replace it with an other switch if you have the hot swap uh, setup uh, um, designed into the board in my case this is hot swappable as is this one by the way and uh, so I can experience uh, I can experiment with different uh, switches which I think is uh, good to have it's uh, very nice uh, to have of course if you know what you are doing you will eventually just solder the switches you care about and don't worry about any kind of hot swappable socket uh, but for me the hot swappable feature is very nice to have the switches that I am using on both uh, boards are tactile switches there are three types of switches there are linear switches such as those you will find on your average laptop uh, where by the curve the force curve is uh, the same basically you type the key and all the way down it's the same feeling you have tactile uh, switches which have a noticeable tactile feedback so you press it and you feel some resistance and after a while you will notice there is the actuation the registration of the key press you will feel the bump this is the idea and depending on the switch the bump will be at a different point on the force uh, curve so how uh, you have to press and whether it is towards the, whether it is early or late or somewhere in the middle so there are lots of uh, things to consider there and then there is a third category which is the clicky kind of switch which is basically the tactile switch but with an audible feedback as well uh, I use the clicky switches on uh, this one uh, but I decided that I prefer the tactile ones rather than the clicky ones I don't need the extra um, audible feedback I like it but I decided that I actually prefer the ambient noise around my hut so the water the birds the frogs I think this is better than hearing the noise that I produce but let me uh, just try to convey how this uh, sounds and uh, hopefully this will work of course I don't know how you hear it because of the water from the stream but let's try 
So this is the uh, tactile switch and of course the sound that you hear is also influenced not just by the switch but also by the profile of the keycap. So lower profile has a different sound than higher profile. And in this case I think it's also bottoming out which is again uh, contributing to what I was saying earlier. This is the idea. Let's see what's the clicky sound like. I have uh, clicky switches here. This is the idea. They are nice. Again, I have no problem working with clicky switches, but since I am here, I have all this uh, nice uh, sound around me. You can hear the birds. So I prefer that, just uh, this. Uh, so here the switches are tactile and silent and I think part of what contributes to the relative quietude, uh, the low uh, sound that this uh, produces, is the keycap as well. So let me uh, try this. I don't know what you can hear, but uh, trust me, this is much more muted than what this is. And they both use tactile switches. Of course, it's the same switch. I am not doing a one-to-one -one comparison here, uh, but I can tell that the lower profile of the keycap of the keycap has an effect, as it has as it had on this one with a cherry profile. And then, of course, the fact that I think I am bottoming out more easily on that uh, low-profile board. So to conclude, uh, folks, uh, programmable keyboards. There is a lot to think about, a lot to study, a lot to research, a lot to experiment with because unfortunately you cannot just theorize about tactility and um, the audible feedback and these sorts of things. You have to actually try it. So you will have to experiment a little bit until you find something that works for you. I think for me I have found the sweet spot here in terms of the switch, in terms of the height of the profile, of course, the split and columnar stagger. Uh, so all these are nice. And uh, then the programmability as well. I didn't talk about that at all, uh, but this is nice as well. I didn't talk about the programmability here, but just to say that basically you should be ignoring the legends. Like when you see uh, what the key is doing, don't trust that. For example, here I have arrow keys. This is the number three, this is Dell. Of course, this is not the case. This is the number two, number one, and arrow keys again. This is because I took these keys uh, that belonged to a standard keyboard and I put them on this uh, keyboard over here and there simply weren't enough keys for me. So I had to find uh, from the number pad and put them there. But what I will do, is I will uh, take screenshots of the layers that I have and I will post them on my website in the publication that will embed this video. So if you are watching this on the video hosting platform, there will be a link to my website where you can also find the screenshots. Just to say on a final note that I am configuring things with the VIA program instead of uh, cloning QMK and working with the C code. The reason is because here at the hut I have mobile internet and uh, I have data caps. So I cannot actually download large files. In this case, I cannot actually work with the QMK repository. It is simply massive. So I am like, okay, no problem, no stress. I will just do it with VIA. And the way I do it is totally fine. I don't really need QMK because I don't use the fancier features of QMK. I experimented with home row mods for a while, but it doesn't work for me because I would often get the wrong key press, even if I would play around with the tapping term. But I don't want to go into too many technicalities. The point is that there is a lot to consider here. I have been doing my research. I am uh, excited to have this. Uh, I forgot to say, I forgot to say, and I would be remiss if I didn't, that this is uh, thanks to a donation by a person who wants to identify as Andreas without any further specifier. I really want to thank Andreas for making this possible. 
uh, because this as well as the gift from Arialdo so this one over here these are an improvement to my quality of life I am NOT exaggerating at all because of course by having uh, a programmable keyboard by having a, a better ergonomic setup I don't put that much pressure uh, on my arm and wrist and so I don't tire out as easily and this means that I can be more productive on the computer and not have as long typing breaks as I would otherwise have to have. So thanks again to Arialdo Martini uh, for uh, helping me get started with mechanical keyboards and for uh, giving me this wonderful gift over here and thanks to Andreas for giving me the uh, iris for uh, uh, doing that generous uh, donation uh, that uh, gave me this. So that's all for today folks. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions about the technicalities, uh, you are welcome to ask me. I, have, I am happy to answer everything. Uh, I may have forgotten something. This is uh, going me going with the flow. Uh, so I, if I have forgotten something, just let me know and I will fill you in on the details. So that's all for now. Uh, take care and uh, goodbye and I hope to recover in uh, the next few months. But we will see. I have to take it easy. Take care, folks. Goodbye.